Hey guys, what's up and welcome back to the Rocket Shop. My name is Philip and today it is finally at the time to present you my most extensive video yet. Well, actually it's a series of videos that goes on for well over an hour. This is the ultimate Raptor engine rundown. Three, two, one. What you are currently watching is part 1 out of 3 of the ultimate rundown on the Rapture engine. In part 1 we will introduce the entire series and take a closer look on the actual rocket combustion, the most important part of any engine. Part 2 will mostly focus on throttling, gimbling, cooling and other engineering stuff and part 3 will be mostly made up of comparing the Raptor's performance to other engines and a conclusion. And because there are a lot of things to cover. I have divided the videos into different chapters with timestamps. You can see them on your screen right now. If you want to rewatch one section or you don't have enough time to watch the entire series, you can always just jump straight forward to the chapter that interests you most. One quick note here, some of the chapters are in the other two parts, so you may have to switch the videos. With that said, Let's start with chapter 1 of the first part, the introduction. Since around 2014, SpaceX is putting significant effort in developing a fully and rapidly usable launch system able to transport up to 100 tons of payload deep into the outer solar system and especially to Mars. This wonder rocket is called Starship and is currently under development in SpaceX's South Texas launch site near Boca Chica Village. But to power such a rocket, SpaceX needs a powerful, reliable and really well performing engine. An engine with capabilities the world hasn't seen before. This rocket engine is nearing the final stage of its development and it is called the Raptor engine. The Raptor is the world's first full flow staged combustion cycle engine to leave the test stand and the first methane powered engine to ever take flight. The Raptor is considered to be one of the most complex engines and its technologies are years ahead of many other rocket engines of our time. Due to having high thrust, small size and high efficiency, it may be the rocket engine enabling us to fly to the other planets of our solar system. For many, the Raptor engine has the potential to become the best rocket engine we are able to create with our available technology. But why is the Raptor engine so much better in nearly every imaginable way and what makes it so special? Those questions are the main topic of this series. We will take a closer look on the design of the Raptor and figure out its advantages and disadvantages regarding the categories of fuel, combustion cycles, engine throttling and many things more. We will try to reconstruct the reasons for most of the important design changing decisions that led to the Raptor being what it is today. And finally, we will compare the Raptor to other remarkable engines and see if the Raptor is indeed the best rocket engine ever created. The very first discipline we will dive in is the world of different combustion cycles. But combustion cycles are very hard to understand if you don't even know the basics of how rocket engines work. And I will break down the different cycles to the basic layout or otherwise we would have to take a look at diagrams like this thing here and that's really confusing stuff. To understand the different combustion cycles we will start out with the basic principles rocket engines are built on. So how do rocket engines actually work? 
The way every single rocket engine ever created generates a force called thrust is based on Newton's third law. Every force generates another force with the same strength pushing in the opposite direction. Rocket engines utilize this physical law by shooting exhaust out of their nozzles to push the rocket forward with the reverse force. This force pushing in the opposite direction of the exhaust is what we know as thrust. The goal of a rocket engine is generating a high amount of thrust. And it achieves this by shooting as much exhaust out as fast as possible since higher mass flow rates equals higher thrust. And because combustion runs more efficient under high pressure and gas always flows from high pressure areas to areas with lower pressure, engineers try to get the pressure in the engine to a few hundred times the ambient pressure at sea level. Burning liquid fuels is the main factor of achieving high pressure since the gas produced by the combustion chamber raises the pressure in the engine because hot gases want to expand, but they are contained by the combustion chamber. That's the basic principle of how a rocket engine generates thrust. The by far easiest design for a rocket engine are so-called pressure-fed engines. A combustion chamber burns fuel coming from highly pressurized tanks to create thrust. Pressure-fed engines are basically just a combustion chamber with a bit of electronics and a cooling system. But they have one problem. To generate huge amounts of thrust, the pressure in the fuel in the rocket's tanks has to be extremely high. And the higher the pressure gets, the thicker the walls of the tank have to be to withstand the pressure, which again adds more weight to the rocket itself and requires more thrust, meaning more engines and bigger tanks, which add weight and need more thrust, and you will see that we are in a hopeless loop here. Pressure-fed engines aren't that efficient and are only used on expandable upper stages due to their simplicity. But on sea level and especially on reusable vehicles, pressure-fed engines aren't the best way to go. Welcome to the world of staged combustion cycles. In a staged combustion cycle, some of the fuel gets burned by a smaller combustion chamber called a pre-burner to power a turbo pump by blowing exhaust on a turbine. Because now there are two stages of combustion, it is called a staged combustion cycle. The turbo pumps are pumping low pressure fuel through the from tanks into the combustion chamber, raising the pressure in the main combustion chamber dramatically. And there are many different staged combustion cycle designs with different layers of free burners and fuel flow. The most commonly used staged combustion cycle type is may, and maybe the easiest iteration of such cycles is the so-called gas generator cycle or open cycle. The open cycle utilizes a separate pre-burner to spin the turbo pumps and that pre-burner is positioned at the side of the engine. The exhaust of the pre-burner is simply dumped overboard. In an open cycle engine, some of the fuel is wasted, but since the pre-burner does only burn a small percentage of the overall fuel, that loss is just about 1 or 2% in efficiency. But what happens if you want to use the exhaust of the pre-burner in the main combustion chamber? Well, that doesn't work, at least for engines running on RP-1. When kerosene is burnt, it doesn't just turn into gas, but also a bit of soot, which you can see as the thin grey clouds of smoke at the edge of the exhaust on some rockets like the Falcon 9. And that bit of soot would cause serious damage to the inside of the main combustion chamber when you try to blow the pre-burner's exhaust in there. Because of that, most RP-1 powered engines are using the open cycle to operate. Among them are the F-1, the engine that powered the first stage of the Saturn V, and SpaceX's Merlin engine used on the Falcon 9 and Falcon Heavy. But blowing the pre-burner exhaust into your main combustion chamber is possible and not even that bad of an idea if your fuel is in kerosene. When looking at engines burning, for example hydrogen or methane, we dive into the world of closed combustion cycles. In a closed combustion cycle, every single bit of fuel is at some point burned in a main combustion chamber, which enables such engines to have an efficiency of more than 98%. But closed combustion cycles couldn't be more different from each other than they are. Most of the variations include having two spree burners instead of just one, 
and all of them vary with their fuel type and mixture. But the most engineering magic becomes visible when looking at the preburners themselves. There are generally two types of preburners fuel rich burning preburners and oxygen rich burning preburners. Fuel rich preburners burn, as the name suggests, a lot of fuel and just a tiny bit of oxygen. That results in cooler exhaust and therefore lower stress for the turbine the preburner is pointed at. But at the same time, running on a fuel-rich mixture makes the preburner rather inefficient, so it needs a lot more fuel relative to its power output than the main combustion chamber. Oxygen-rich preburners, on the other hand, are way more efficient than fuel-rich preburners. But the exhaust is so hot that building an oxygen-rich preburner was considered to be impossible for a long time because there were no known metal alloys able to withstand the extreme temperatures. In the early 1990s, after the collapse of the Soviet Union, American engineers found that the Soviet had in fact developed such an alloy with exactly those capabilities and the engine were running on oxygen-rich preburners. Today we are able to design engines with oxygen-rich running preburners but most closed cycle engines still use fuel-rich preburners. When looking at a typical hydrogen-powered engine, you might recognize a second preburner. But having two preburners instead of just one doesn't change the fact that those engines are all running on a closed combustion cycle. And for the famous space shuttle main engine, the Aerojet Rocketdyne RS-25, both of those preburners ran fuel-rich. So why did it have two preburners at all? On engines running on RP-1, the turbo pumps for fuel oxygen are powered by the same preburner. But due to hydrogen having an extremely low density, it could easily leak out of the turbo pump and cause an uncontrolled explosion when coming into contact with the oxygen. To avoid that, the engineers designed the engine with two different shafts, with two separate turbines and therefore two different preburners. That's why some of the closed cycle engines have two preburners, just to increase the safety of the engine. And then there's the third solution of a staged combustion cycle. The full flow staged combustion cycle. This special type of closed combustion cycle is considered to be the holy grail of rocket engine design and was developed only three times in the entire history of spaceflight. The Russians tried it once with their RD-270 project, the American tried to build such an engine in mid-2000 and the third try is, yep, SpaceX's Raptor engine. It is the first engine operating on a full flow cycle to ever leave the test stand and actually power a flying rocket. In this case, it is Starship and a super heavy booster. So how does the Raptor work? The full flow stage combustion cycle is a variation of the closed cycle and involves two preburners. One of them is burning fuel rich and the other one oxygen rich. But unlike other engine cycles, all of the fuel and all of the oxygen gets preburned, leading to the main combustion chamber being filled with two hot gases, one fuel rich and one oxygen rich. Every other engine type is burning liquid fuel and oxygen in the main combustion chamber. The Raptor ignites two gases instead, meaning it is a gas gas burning engine. Due to the general behavior of gases, the energy required to ignite the combustion chamber is lower and the efficiency gets even higher with the Raptor being able to get about 99% of the available energy of it out of its fuel and convert it into a thrust, making the Raptor one of the most efficient if not the single most efficient rocket engine ever created. As many advantages as the full flow stage combustion cycle may hold, it brings many engineering challenges with it. An engine like the Raptor is incredibly complex with two different preburners, insulation and plumbing. SpaceX had to develop several super alloys for the engine to work and hasn't quite finished the evolution of the engine after almost a decade. The insane complexity of the full flow cycle is what scared the most engineers and held them away from developing a full flow stage combustion cycle engine but SpaceX took the challenge and it is not far away from tackling it. Combustion cycles are the heart of any rocket engine. When trying to understand different rocket engines, you must know how the individual combustion cycles work. I will put them up on screen right now for a short moment 
so you can compare them by yourselves and find a difference in similarities between them. If you need a bit more time than I give you, just pause the video here. the rapture engines burns its fuel, we mm, can go on to talk about the fuel itself and figure out why SpaceX chose a rather unconventional type of fuel to power the rapture. Rocket engines can generate energy by combusting fuel and some kind of oxidizer, in the most cases liquid oxygen. But there are different fuels commonly used in the space flag industry, depending on which task the engine is designed to do. Among all the liquid fuels there are kerosene or RP1, hydrogen, methane and hypergolic fuels made up of hydrazine. Those four types of fuel are the most commonly used ones. Additionally to liquid fuels, solid rocket fuels are practically the only other source of energy available for rocket motors. But SRBs are not comparable to a complex engine like the Raptor, since they don't even have a proper engine. In an SRB, the fuel simply burns down from the top to the bottom like a candle and the exhaust is be just being pointed downwards. There are no fuel pipes, no turbo pumps, pre-burners or combustion cycles of any kind. Solid rocket motors have literally nothing in common with liquid rocket engines like the Raptor. Every rocket fuel has some individual properties giving engines different advantages depending on how they are used. Before choosing a fuel for your new engine, engineers have to figure out which fuel is suited best for the task they want their vehicle to do. Every rocket fuel comparison has a different outcome depending on the requirements the fuel has to fit. But there are multiple properties everyone has to look at, like density, which is important for the weight of the fuel you need to create a certain amount of thrust, the temperature the fuel has to be stored at, the burn ratio of fuel and oxidizer deciding the size of the tank of the rocket and the product of the combustion process for environmental impact. In case of the Raptor engine, there are of course some additional fuel requirements due to the task Starship is set to do. SpaceX needs the fuel to have the ability to be produced on Mars for the return flights of crewed Mars missions, as well as the ability to refuel the rocket in low Earth orbit for maximizing the payload capacity. And if that wasn't enough, the fuel has to be, had to be suitable for engine reusability. SpaceX had to find a fuel that works out in every single of those categories for the new Raptor engine. But effectively, there are just three options available. The Kerolox option, made of RP1 and hydrogen, Hydrox, which is hydrogen and oxygen, and of course Methalox, which is the organic compound methane burned with liquid oxygen. In terms of density, RP1 outperforms the other fuels by the value of 813 grams per liter, making it the best fuel for high thrust rates. That's why RP-1 is commonly used in the first stages of multi-stage rockets like the Saturn V, the Soyuz or the Falcon 9. Hydrogen on the other hand is incredibly undense with just 70 grams per liter, meaning hydrogen tanks will be really big. And due to having such a low density, hydrogen leaks out of every small crack or hole, meaning it is hard to contain. Methane is right of the, in the middle in terms of density with 422 grams per liter, sadly 2 grams too heavy to be 420 grams, about half of RP-1, meaning it still offers a lot of energy, while not making the tanks too large and staying easy to contain. For the storage temperature, we, the temperature the fuel has to be kept at to stay in its liquid state, we have to take two numbers into consideration, the melting point and the boiling point since the fuel can be kept at any temperature in between. Numbers closer to zero are the best here, because a lower temperature means 
less efforts to keep it liquid. RP1 has a fairly high melting point at 490 Kelvin and a freezing point of 213 degrees Kelvin, meaning, in cat, meaning it can be kept without any additional cooling at room temperature. But despite that, SpaceX actually cools their RP1 down to close to its freezing point to make it denser and therefore squeeze more energy out of the rocket. That solution is not necessary though, but it will deliver some nice advantages. The second most common used fuel is hydrogen, and hydrogen has to be stored at increasingly low temperatures close to the absolute zero since it points into a gas at just 20 degrees Kelvin and freezes at 14 degrees. Hydrogen needs a lot of extra insulation and therefore adds weight to the vehicle. And hydrogen isn't that nice for interplanetary travel since it easily boils off due to its low boiling point. And if you haven't guessed it by now, methane is right in the middle of the two other fuels, with a boiling temperature of 111 Kelvin and a freezing point of 90 Kelvin, making it not too hard to contain, but suitable for interplanetary flights due to not boiling off as fast as hydrogen. And methane has another advantage property. Methane and oxygen can be stored at approximately the same temperature, that enables engineers to use one and the same tank wall for both fuels, so-called common domes. The top of the methane tank can at the same time be the bottom of the oxygen one and vice versa, meaning the engineers can cancel out a lot of weight. Another important aspect of rocket fuels is the burn ratio of fuel to oxidizer. Burn ratio decides how big your tanks have to be and therefore have a huge impact on the dry weight of the vehicle. The less liters of fuel you need for 1 liter of oxygen, the smaller your fuel tank is going to be. RP1 is typically burned at a ratio of 1 to 0.52, 1 liter of oxygen combusts with just a bit more than half a liter of RP1. Since RP1 has a density far higher than the density of liquid oxygen, the weight added by the RP1 and its tanks is as small as it can get. RP1 is probably the most efficient rocket fuel in terms of tank size. On the opposite side of the scale again is hydrogen, which burns 1 liter of oxygen per 6 liters of hydrogen. And since hydrogen has such a low density, the fuel tanks of hydrogen powered rockets are absolutely huge compared to the amount of thrust their fuel offers. You can pretty clearly see that on the Delta IV Heavy, which is powered by hydrogen entirely. The entire rocket is larger than the RP-1 powered Falcon Heavy, but can only lift about half the amount of payload of the Falcon Heavy due to the tanks taking up so much space. A comparable kerosene powered rocket would be way smaller than the Delta IV Heavy, probably just a bit larger than the Atlas V. And like always, methane is in right in the middle between the other two fuels, with a ratio of 0.73 liters of methane per liter of oxygen making both tanks for oxygen and methane approximately the same size. And in the future, something else will become more and more important in terms of rocket fuels. The stuff they become when burned. The emissions and byproducts of rocket combustion haven't been that big of a topic in the past, but in a world more and more committed to environmental protection, rocket emissions might be something some people see as a danger to climate. So. What do all those rocket fuels emit when they are burnt? In a standard combustion with liquid oxygen, RP1 pretty much behaves like jet fuel or car gas. But the stuff that comes out is pretty nasty. RP1 powered engines emit a whole lot of carbon dioxide, water vapor and together with some small amounts of sulfuric compounds and soot. And especially those last two named byproducts are very nasty for the atmosphere. Hydrogen, on the other hand, burns really clean and produces nothing else than a lot of water vapor. But despite that looking quite clean, water vapor in higher atmospheric layers can be a more effective greenhouse gas than carbon dioxide. And methane is like always in the middle with byproducts of carbon dioxide and water vapor, just like RP1, but without all the sulfuric and sooty stuff RP1 produces. But the one quick note has to be made here. All of the fuels emit, emit some nitrogen oxides, which are also not great for the environment. When the heat of the rocket engine's exhaust comes into contact with the atmospheric nitrogen, 
some of the nitrogen at atoms react with the oxygen around them, forming those oxides. But since that is unavoidable and every rocket fuel emits them, I have left them out due to all fuels emitting them and only in smaller amounts. The last general stats engineers may have to take a look at is fuel efficiency. This stat is measured in maximum theoretical specific impulse or short the maximum ISP. But specific impulse is weird. It says how efficient a rocket engine is, but the unit it is given in is seconds. That is because specific impulse measures the time an engine can accelerate with 9.81 newtons while using 1 kilogram of propellant. And that time is measured in seconds. The more seconds the engine can accelerate with 1g, the more efficient it burns its fuel. Especially for engines aiming for use on interplanetary missions, high efficiency is important. But the maximum specific impulse is not just dependent on the engine itself, but it's strongly connected to its fuel, because different fuels have an upper limit for engine efficiency, called the maximum theoretical ISP. The maximum ISP for RP1 is at around 370 seconds. But not a single RP-1 powered engine will ever reach a specific impulse that high since the laws of physics don't allow 100% of combustion efficiency. But numbers above 300 seconds are possible and have been reached already by SpaceX's Merlin engine. Hydrogen on the other hand burns extremely efficient and has a maximum theoretical ISP of 532 seconds. That's more than one and a half times of the ISP of RP-1. And due to burning that efficiency, hydrogen is often used in upper stage engines like the RL-10 or the J-2 and the RS-25, which reach top values of around 430 seconds in operation. And if you haven't guessed it by now, methane is again in the middle of those two extremes with a maximum ISP of 459 seconds. But again, Engines like the Raptor will probably never exceed values of around 380 to 400 seconds in vacuum. But SpaceX's goals for the Raptor engine are so insane that they needed to take a look at even more factors here. Maybe the most important one is the ability to produce the fuel on Mars, since carrying all the fuel for the journey back home to Mars and back would limit the payload capacity dramatically. But propellant production on Mars is difficult and may be the knockout for some of the rocket fuels in this comparison. RP-1, for example, can't be used for propellant production on Mars since it is based on oil and there is no oil on Mars since there never were trees on Mars. So for propellant availability on Mars, RP-1 receives a clear no. Hydrogen can be produced from the subsurface ice on Mars and electrolysis. And that reaction has oxygen as a byproduct. Hydrogen seems ideal here at the first look, but it has a problem of having a low density again. Hydrogen has to be kept extremely cold and in advanced tanks to not just vaporize into the Martian atmosphere. And all the effort to contain the hydrogen needs so much energy that it is practically impossible to produce on Mars. And methane is made out of carbon and hydrogen, and both elements are found on Mars in huge quantities. Hydrogen can be produced by doing electrolysis of the subsurface water ice, and carbon can be filtered out of the carbon dioxide rich atmosphere of Mars. During a chemical reaction down to the Sabatier process, SpaceX will be able to generate the fuel on Mars. And other than hydrogen, methane is far easier to contain and doesn't boil out that easy. Methane is ideal for in-situ resource utilization on Mars. And the very last factor, I promise that, is the ability for orbital refueling. Orbital refueling offers the ability to increase the payload capacity to orbit, the moon, Mars and even beyond. But not every fuel is ideal for transfer from one starship to another. Density plays an important role here. RP-1 might even be the best option for orbital refueling. It hasn't got to be extremely cold and density is fairly high, meaning leaks are not so likely to appear and cause propellant loss. But hydrogen shows exactly the opposite behavior of RP-1. 
it is undense, leaks out quickly, and boils off nearly instantly. Hydrogen can be transferred from one ship to another, but it is way too hard to be accomplished on Starship. And methane is like always the perfect balance in between the two extremes. It is not too undense and doesn't leak that quickly. It can be transferred between two starships as not as good as RP-1, but better than hydrogen. As you can see, methane isn't the best option in almost every way. But other than hydrogen and RP-1, it has no major flaw. Methane performs okay in every category and it is the only suitable fuel for long-term mass missions. RP-1 may be the best fuel for high thrust numbers and hydrogen may be better for efficient in-space propulsion, but methane has both properties. It can generate a lot of thrust and is, with specific impulses of up to 400 seconds, still burning extremely efficient. Choosing methane was literally the only option SpaceX had for the rupture engine, and probably that's why they did so. And due to being powered on methane, SpaceX had to start from scratch on, since the Raptor is the first methane engine to ever take flight and among the first methane engines ever developed. Methane has the best properties, but it brings many engineering challenges along. With completing our run on rocket fuels, we are already at the end of the first part of the Raptor Rundown series. In part 2, we will take a closer look at the engine control mechanisms and ignition processes. If you want to know more about the Raptor, I would recommend watching the next part. It will release soon after this video and will be linked at the end. This video alone has cost me more than 40 hours of my life to script, record and cut. It's a lot of work for me to give you the content you deserve, so I'd really appreciate it if you hit the like button, share the video with your friends and subscribe to the Rocket Shop. We see ourselves in part 2 and until then, I am out. Cheers.